us the Lord. Praise God. You may be seated. Give honor to uh, Bishop Johnny Amos, my father in the gospel, Pastor Roshan. Give honor to the house of Shiloh. I love you guys. Yes, yes, we love you. So awesome. So awesome. We are really a family in this house. When one hurts, the other hurts. I thank the Lord for that. We have relationship. And I, I intend to get closer to some of you that I don't know. Because I'm, I'm kind of a loner type person. Not, you know, not trying to be funny or anything, but you know, that's just who I am. But I would love to get to know some of you better. Amen. And uh, I just praise God for him choosing me to stand in this place. Who am I? Like Pastor, uh, I said, oh, oh, called you Pastor. Pastor Torrance said that Bishop said he reached way down to pick me up. I want to tell you, tell you some things I wouldn't even want you to know. Amen. Amen. So uh, again, this month we're on relationships, and Pastor Steve started us, us out with the ministry of reconciliation. And the next Sunday, Pastor Gamel preached to us about preparing the bride the wife has made herself ready. And last week, Bishop preached to us about navigating in the minefields of offense. And if you missed that, I'm telling you, you better go out there and watch that. No traps. There's lots of traps. Today, I'm, I'm going to speak to you about how is your relationship with the Savior. I got a disclaimer. This was for me before it was for you. You know, the ball goes out and it bounces back. So I needed it. I needed this. This is why the Lord put these words in my heart because I needed it. Amen. So we're going to go to the throne of grace. Father God, I just thank you today. Thank you, Lord, for your love and your kindness and your tender mercy. God, we just lift you up because you said if you were lifted up, you would draw all men unto you. Just thank you. I ask you to forgive us, God. Forgive us for all unrighteousness. Some things that we try to ignore, God. Forgive us, God. Bring it to our forefront because we want to be in right standing with you today. I thank you, Lord, that you let me stand here in front of these kings and these priests, the people of God. Lord, open up our ears, open up our hearts, open up our eyes to hear what the Spirit has to say today. Lord, and I know you always bring deliverance. You always bring healing, God. You always bring comfort, God, encouragement, God. And we just thank you, God, for the God that you are. You are God and God alone. And no one else can help because you don't need no help, God. And we always try to help you, but you don't need any help, God. We need your help. God, we just thank you and praise you. In Jesus' mighty name, I, as I speak, God, let me speak with clarity, Lord. Let me speak with conviction, God. Let me speak with revelation knowledge, God. And I pray, God, that someone's life will be changed today. We just thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So y'all know I'm long-winded, so I'm going to try to talk real fast. So I, um, a while ago, had a conversation with the Lord, an honest conversation, which we need to do all the time. And... He was showing me in my past and sometimes now that I all put people in front of him and put myself in front of him, getting in the way with the relationship that I have with him, damaging him, damaging our relationship. 
And I knew deep in my spirit some of the things that I was doing was wrong, but I was in denial because I wanted the approval of people. So, you know I'm a scripture person, so y'all gonna get a bunch of scripture today, but it's good. It's, it's gonna correct us. Me first, amen? So Jeremiah 17 and five says, thus saith the Lord, cursed be the man that trusted the man and make flesh his arm and whose heart depart from the Lord. Because once we start trying to please people and please ourselves, our heart is departing from God. Psalms 118 and eight says, it's better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. Now you know, your relationship with God determines what kind of relationship that you will have with others. And until you are totally and completely satisfied with him, you're not gonna be capable of a solid relationship with humans. Because it is God who teaches us and gives us the power to love correctly. Our flesh is selfish and self-centered. And no good thing comes from us unless it comes from God. Satan loves nothing more but to separate us from God so he can destroy us with his tricks and his deception. Yes. Satan always makes sin appear like it's a no harm in what you're doing or you're saying that is against God. He loves to camouflage. He always mixes a little truth in with the lie to make it look true. And if you don't have a close relationship with the Savior, you'll be fooled. Just like Eve was drawn away by her own lust and entice when the Lord had told her and had not to eat of the tree in the midst of the garden or they would surely die. And here comes Satan right behind them. Genesis 3, 4, and 5. And the serpent said unto the woman, you shall not surely die. You see, he always says the opposite of what God says. That's how you know it's him. You know, today people hate women, but they want to look like one. Hate men, but they want opposite of what God says. Backwards. This is Satan. He told her, you won't surely die. You will not. God doeth know that in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes will be open and you'll be as God's knowing good and evil. And he didn't tell her the whole truth, you see. He, 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 he said some truths. Whole time Adam was standing right there. It's true she didn't die immediately physically, but she died immediately spiritually. And she didn't have an idea that she was going to be separated from her direct fellowship with God. They had direct, hallelujah, can you imagine? Direct fellowship with God. And she would be put out of her lovely home, the garden. She would bear children and sorrow. All kind of things went on because of the choice. But thanks be to God, hallelujah, who is Alpha and Omega and knows the end from the beginning that he sent Jesus, his son, to reconcile us back unto himself. And he gave us that wonderful message of reconciliation according to 2 Corinthians 5, 19. And let me just tell you some of my life experiences and bad choices as a young Christian trying to please people and not hurt their feelings by not telling them the truth. Well, Something as simple as giving somebody a ride. Sounds harmless, right? Jesus. Well, they said they needed to go pick up something that belonged to them from somebody else. But you know what? There was always a warning before destruction, and in my, in my spirit, I just didn't feel right about it, but I did it anyway. What I was thinking in my head, this is a drug run. Yeah, it, it, it was, it was. And um, I just went on and did it and didn't say anything. Secondly, it's, it's, this sounds harmless too. Um, same person. He said, could you make this deposit at the bank for me because I don't have time. I said, okay, sure. And then when I saw the amount of cash, I know his job didn't pay him now. So I knew indirectly what he was doing, okay? Thirdly, another person. I took blood money from them. 
Y'all know what I'm talking about. Blood money. And of course, I needed the money. I was greedy and I wanted the money. So it was a gift and I took it. You see? See how Satan has little tricks? No harm, right? Yes, yes harm. Because I knew in my spirit it wasn't right. That same person one day went shopping and they came on my house showing me all their stuff and they had a bunch of shoe boxes and they said, hey, you know, I got so much stuff in the car. Let me leave these shoe boxes here until I come back. No harm, right? They're just shoe boxes. Nah. When they left, I looked at them lined with money. Just lined with money. They could have put what actually they did put my household in danger. You see what I'm saying? Not just because of what it was and where it came from, because they had a friend with them when it came. He could have doubled back and shot everybody up because he knew what was in those boxes. So I had to, the Lord, the Lord always warns us, I had to stop dealing with them people and dealing with their money, whether it was a gift or not. That last person was my baby brother, who I love dearly. Remember, James 4 and 17 says, remember, it is sin, and I'm in the NLT, to know what you ought to do and then not do it. I wanted the approval and a little kickback, and I thought that I would be satisfied, but I wasn't. Only Jesus can satisfy what your soul is longing for. Amen. Colossians 3, 17 in the King James Version says, Whatsoever you do, in word, whatever you say, every idle word you're going to be accounted for, or deed, whatever you do, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. Was I doing that to glorify God? Definitely not. I wanted to gain favor of man and money. We, we, me included, we have to be the light of God. Yes. My friend used to say it's tight, but it's right. We have to be the light of God. And this next scripture is what I should have been doing. This is Ephesians 5, pretty lengthy, 1 through 20, but it's good for us. The word corrects us. Imitate God, therefore, in everything that you do, because you are his dear children. We cannot forget who we are and whose we are, who we belong to. Second verse says, live a life filled with love. Was it love not telling them that they was wrong and partaking with them? No. If you had some body, a friend, or anybody laying on the train track, you see the train coming, you just gonna sit there and let them get run over. You gonna say, hey, the train is coming. Gonna blow the trumpet loud, the train is coming. Get up, get up. But we sometimes, we get real comfortable and desensitized to sin. The rest of that verse says, we should follow the example of Christ. He loved us and offered us, as, offered himself as a sacrifice for us, a pleasing aroma to God. Let there be no sexual immorality, impurity, or listen to this, greed. I was greedy for the money. Such sins have no place among God's people. The love of money, not the money, but the love of it is the root of all evil and it will send you on a downward path. The next verse tells us not to partake in these things. Obscene stories, foolish talk, coarse or nasty jokes. These are not for you. Instead, let there be thankfulness to God. Now, let's not get it twisted. Proverbs 17 and 22 tells us a merry heart does a person good like medicine and a broken spirit will dry up the bones. But our fun has to be clean. Amen. Has to be clean fun. And sometimes there's a time and a season for everything. Sometimes we're joking around too much. 
we have to know. We have to be careful not to get sucked in or wrapped up with the world. They're the things that they think are funny when they're telling their sinful jokes or saying sinful remarks and we're standing there just laughing knowing that it is ungodly. The world will say, ah, oh, come on, it's just a joke. And they're gonna say that because it takes the light off of them. And if you are partaking with them, then the light that we are supposed to bring won't shine on them to help uncover their sin. And if we agree with them, they'll think that we're walking with them. Amos 3 and 3 tells us, can two walk together except they agree? Are you going to agree with their ungodly behavior? And you can't walk left and right at the same time. You split yourself in two. James 3, 10 and 12 says, out of this mouth proceeded blessings and cursings. My brother, these things ought not to be so. How you want? Be in hallelujah. And then go outside and cut somebody out. Well, because they made you mad. You got offended like a bishop preached about last week. This ought not to be. Do if a fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter? No. Can the fig tree, my brother, bear olive berries? I've never saw it. Either vine fig, so can no fountain both yield salt water and fresh. And the fifth verse says, you can be sure that no immoral, impure, or greedy person will inherit the kingdom of Christ and of God. For a greedy person, which was what I was, is an idolater, worshiping the things of the world. I told you I wanted the money and the favor of man, which is idolatry. Don't be fooled by those who try to excuse these sins, for the anger of God will fall on all who disobey him. Don't participate in the things these people do. For once you were full of darkness, but now you have the light from the Lord. So live as people of light. We're not the people of dark. For this light within you produces only what is good and right and true. Carefully, when you get in situations, this, this scripture says carefully determine what pleases God. Does this please God? Can I take them to the liquor store knowing I'm enabling them to help them get drunk? Does that please God? Do I let them smoke and drink in my house and I say that I love the Lord? Does this please God that I sit there and watch them tear their body up? You see what I'm saying? And I, and I, and I tell people a lot of times they, they think you're judging them, but smoking, smoking ain't gonna send me to hell, but it's going to damage your body. It's gonna help you get to heaven quicker. That's the way I feel about it. Take no part in the worthless deeds of evil and darkness. Instead, expose them. It is shameful even to talk about the things that ungodly people do in secret. But their evil inventions will be exposed when the light shines on them. For the light makes everything visible. This is why it said, awake, O oh sleeper. Wake up, church. Rise up from the dead and Christ will give you light. We should be living by the power of the Holy Spirit. The next verse says, so be careful how you live. Don't live like fools, but like those that are wise. Make the most of every opportunity in these evil days and don't act thoughtlessly. Think it through, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. Understand what the Lord wants you to do. Don't be drunk with wine because this will ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit, singing psalms and hymns, spiritual songs among yourself, and making music to the Lord in your hearts. And give thanks for everything to God, the Father, in the name of Jesus Christ. So, we should be asking ourselves every day, Lord, how's my relationship with you? We don't want to deceive ourselves by watering down the gospel to please ourselves and others. We have to be that light in this dark and evil world. John 1 and 9 says that he is that true light, the light of every man that cometh in the world. And we should have him in us. So we have the light in us. Now I hear people say, oh, I'm a good person. Oh, really? Nothing good but the Father. I used to say that. Oh, I ain't doing nothing. 
do nothing, I'm good. You know, I'm, that's the new word too, I'm good. You say, how you doing, how's your walk? I'm good. Yeah, right, but Jeremiah says something different about us without God. Let me, let me tell you what he says. 17, 9 through 10 says the heart, this heart right here, because out, out of the heart flows the issues of life. Out of the heart, the bubbles of your mouth speak. Out of the heart, everything is the center of everything. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Desperately, which means extremely wicked without God. Who can know it? I the Lord searcheth the heart. I try the reins, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the freedom of his doings. That's why we should be asking God to examine, ask God, because we don't miss stuff. Ask him to examine our hearts daily, on a daily, daily basis, because there might be something there that we can't see or we don't want to see. And we are quick to point out other people's stuff. We ain't got no problem with that. She did this, he did that. But we got an issue when it comes to us. We can't see nothing. I'm, I'm good. I can do nothing wrong. I'm, I'm fine. But you, you want to beat your brother down. Get that moat out of your eye first. You know, God knows everything. And you know if your flesh loves whatever or whoever it is, it is not godly. You already know that. You already know that it's not his will for your life. Paul was speaking to the Galatians in chapter 6, 7 through 10. He said, don't be misled. You cannot mock the justice of God. You will always harvest what you plant. Those who live only to satisfy their own sinful nature will harvest decay and death from the sinful nature. But those who live to please the Spirit will harvest everlasting life from the Spirit. Let me tell you about that word decay. When something is decayed, it didn't just happen, boom, 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 overnight. But it gradually deteriorates and wastes away or rots because of the bacteria. And in this case, we're talking about the bacteria of sin. The next verse says, so let's not get tired of doing what is good. At just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessings if we don't give up. Truth is, we all get discouraged. We all get tired. We all get weary. But we need to take note from David who encouraged himself. We had to encourage ourselves in the Word. Encourage ourselves with God done in the past, what He's doing now, and what He's going to do. Start singing. I bet it'll leave. Because I get, I get depressed sometimes. I don't know about you. Some of the things that's going on in the world makes me depressed. I begin to sing, hallelujah, and lifts that heavy weight up off of me. Hallelujah, thank you, God. Thank you for your songs, God, hallelujah. In just a few words, what he's trying to tell us is whatever we plant, we're going to harvest. Was I planting seeds of holiness and righteousness by taking and helping with that money that was received from the evilness of men and I, I knew it even though it wasn't spoken? No, not at all. I was planting the wrong type of seeds in my garden. Seeds of greediness to obtain the things of the world and the favor of men. My harvest would have been death had I not repented and turned away from it and turned to Christ. I would have perished just like that money is going to perish. And, and everybody and everything else, if they don't put their hand in God's hand. Question for you today, what kind of harvest do you desire? And what are you planting in your garden? Oh, I hear someone say, oh, that, that wasn't nothing. You can't do nothing. Well, let me tell you what our brother Solomon said in 2.15 in LT. Young women of Jerusalem, catch all the foxes those little foxes, but they, that before they ruin the vineyard of love, before they ruin your relationship with God, for the great vines are blossoming. You see, it's the little foxes, the little sins that we have a tendency to overlook that spoils the vine. Let me explain this. The foxes, the little foxes, they were too little to get to the top of the vine where the grapes was. So they would eat at the base of the vine until it fell over to them and they could get it and pull it, pull it 
to the ground. You hear what I'm saying? Pull it down to the ground. Satan wants to pull you down. He wants to deceive you. He wants to pull you down to the ground and eat you alive. He ain't trying to hurt you. He wants to destroy you. And those little seemingly no harm sins are part of his tricks and deceits. Second Corinthians tells us he's the angel of light in 11 and 14. He disguises himself as an angel of light. He makes sin appealing on the surface, the pleasure of sin. The pleasure of sin. But he's a trickster, my daddy used to say. He's a trickster. Y'all know what John 10 and 10 says? It told you who he was. What does it say? He is the thief. And he comes, what's his purpose? Steal, kill, and destroy. But the Lord said, I come that you have life and that more abundantly. So what we call little no harm sins, they chew at the foundation of our relationship with the Savior. We want Christ to be the solid rock. Y'all know I had to have some of him. He, you want him to be the foundation. Yes, his, he should be the foundation. Christ is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand, and everything around is shaking. I never been more glad that I put my trust in Jesus cause he's never let me down. He's faithful through generations so why would he fail now? He won't, he won't, he won't fail. us little by little to bring us down until eventually if we're not honest with ourselves and God and asking him to check our hearts and our walk daily we find ourselves falling away from God just slowly drifting to the ground so those little foxes they have desensitized us to sin and pretty soon everything's okay Everything's okay. Like when I was growing up, everything was a sin. But when you get yourself away from God, everything is a sin. He's just waiting on you. You know, if you watch the animal kingdom, and there were a whole pack of them just walking in the line, sitting back in the cut. He's sitting back looking like this. Who can I get? Hmm. You know who we gonna get? The one that's lagging behind. It's disconnected, disconnected from his, his church family. People are, I don't need to go to church. For Satan, not to assemble yourself together, even the more as you see the day coming, because we need one another. Yes. He's going to pounce on him as soon as he gets a chance, because he's lagging behind, disconnected from God, disconnected from his family. We don't watch out. We are slowly drift away and find ourselves on the way to hell. And there are no exits in hell. There's no do-overs in hell. No second chances. It'll be your final destination that you choose and go uninvited because God didn't invite you. He said he suffered that none be lost, but all must come to repentance. But Satan is going to welcome you because he want to torture you some more. Unlike leprosy, which today is called Hansen's disease, it eats from the outside, so you can see it immediately to the inside. But sin, it eats from the inside out. So you think you hide it. You ain't hiding nothing from God, but you might be hiding it from other people. But eventually, guess what? It's going to appear. Boom. There it is. And you're going to be like, oh, how did I get here? How did Because you stop praying. You stop reading his word. You stop fasting. You stayed away from the church family. You didn't want to talk to them. You start watching a bunch of crazy mess on TV. They filled up your spirit. Your eye gate was open to a bunch of mess. Your ear gate. You touching and feeling things that you should not feel. That's how that you get there. We have to stay focused on God and be aware of the tricks of the enemy. To keep on our whole armor and get guarded up for sin. 
Though we walk in the flesh, we don't war after the flesh. The weapons of our, car, our, our, our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. We gotta pull those strongholds down. We don't wanna grieve the Holy Spirit who loves us. He loves us so well. God already knows anyway what you're doing. And we couldn't be so ignorant to think that he doesn't know and that you're hiding from him. But if you do, be fooling yourself. There's nowhere that you can hide from him. Read Psalms 139. If, if you go to hell, he's there. He's there in hell. He's everywhere. Psalms 90 and 8 says, you spread out our sins before you, our secret sins, and you see them all. Just, just like the story of David. David, a man after God's own heart, 2 Samuel 11, 12. He decided to be idle and stay back while the men were at war. And then he's on the rooftop looking over at the sheep. Nothing wrong with him, he's just looking. He's just looking. Not before he knew it, sin had, the lust had entered into his heart. You know, Matthew tells you, in 5 and 28, if you look upon a woman to lust after, you already committed an adultery in your heart. So he sent his servant over to get her and bring her to the palace and sleep with her, knowing that he was, she was someone else's wife. He thought he was slick, because you know, he the king, he could do whatever he wanted to do. Idol. Then she sends a message to him that she's pregnant. Oh my God, how's she gonna explain that to her husband Uriah who's out on the battlefield? Couldn't be his. So David had to think up a twisted thing to do. He had to bring Uriah off of the battlefield and act like he was asking about how the war is going, you know, how the captain doing, just lying. Then he feeds him and tells him, go home, go home to your wife. Yeah, you know Uriah wasn't going to do that. Uriah was so dedicated and faithful, unselfish, he was thinking about his fellow soldiers at war, and they were out living in the tents and sleeping, you know, on the ground. He didn't go home and lie in his comfortable bed with his wife. He laid in the doorway of the palace and went to sleep. When David heard that his little plan backfired, he asked him to stay a couple more days and then invited him to dinner and got him drunk. He thought that was gonna do the trick. Told him to go home with his wife. He did not. He stayed in the doorway again. That didn't work. So he decided to have them put him on the front line to kill him so he could cover up his sin. You see what I'm saying? From just a look yeah. to lust, to the act of adultery, which again, he already committed in his heart to lying, to murder. Little foxes, you see how the devil slew walked him with his tricks? So never think that you are so righteous that you don't need God to check you or your brothers and sisters. That's why he said, forsake not to send yourself together because somebody gonna see something. The Holy Spirit points things out. It's like, I love them. Let me have someone speak to them. Can't hide. But listen, when Nathan came to tell David, he was in such deceit and denial. He came and told him that this rich man had a bunch of lambs and, the, and this poor man only had one and then he took his and he, oh, David was furious. He needs to be killed. Pay him back four times. He's still in deceit and denial. See how sin does? It takes you further than you want to go and let you, want you to stay further than you, stay longer than you want to stay. So finally, Nathan had to say, David, you are the man. But he repented, thank God. But the sword never left his house. Baby didn't live. One of his sons raped his daughter. One of his sons, Absalom, tried to take over his kingdom, and so on and so on. So it doesn't just affect us when we sin. It affects our children, the third and the fourth generation, unless they accept Jesus Christ. We have to be careful what we do. We are our own worst enemy, and I say that to you all the time. When you think you arrive, you brother, sister, you're in trouble. Remember. 
the one who slayed the lion, the bear, and the giant Goliath, a man after God's own heart. So don't think you can fool God. You're not smart enough to fool God. David is one, the one that wrote in Psalms 119 and the NLT uh, 10 and 11, I have tried hard to find you. Don't let me wander from your commandments. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. We need to hide his word. It will rise up when temptation comes to us and it's gonna come. That's why Psalms 1 and 2 tells us to meditate on his word day and night. Matter of fact, it says you shouldn't walk in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But your delight, our delight, should be in the law of the Lord. And in that law, we need to be meditating day and night, and then we'll be like that tree that's planted by the river of water. You see, it ain't going nowhere because it's rooted and grounded. We'll be like the tree planted by the rivers of water that bring it forth its fruit in the season, and your leaf will not wither. Whatsoever you do will prosper, but the ungodly are not so. They're like the shaft which the wind drives away, that hole off of the wheat, and they throw it up and it's waste, it blows away. The shaft which the wind drives away. Therefore, they will not stand in the judgment. You want to stand in the judgment. Nor sinners in the seat of the righteous, of the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows our way. He knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly will perish. We don't want to perish. So we don't, we, we, we can't, we're not dissing anybody, but we can't do the things that they do. We can't hang out and go to places that they go. We, we have to ask God how to be wise fishermen to reel them in and set them up. I set my son up the other day, fed him, watching some history stuff on TV. Boom. Tried to tell him there's only one way to get to heaven. Forget about what all these people are saying. The Lord said, I am the way, the truth, and the light, and no man come to the Father by, but by me. You better believe it. Yes. Amen. They got you all messed up with all this philosophy of themselves, all this mess. You can't get around God. When, and, and another thing about this story, when men are on the battlefield, they don't just lay their weapon down and decide to go take a break. Unless they want to put their life and other people's life in danger and allow the enemy to overtake them. There are no breaks. We are in daily spiritual warfare with sin and Satan for ourselves. But the good news is, in John 16, 13, the Lord said, in this world you're going to have trouble. Yes, you're going to have tribulation. But be of good cheer, for he has overcome this world. Yes, yes. So if we stay an exclusive relationship with him. We already had the victory won. Yes. Matthew 6 and 33 says, seek ye the kingdom of God first. Put him first in his righteousness and all these other things will be added unto you. All those other things I wanted to get with that money all right. was added to me because I decided that nobody comes between me and him. I'm just saying, like Linda says, I'm just saying. First Peter 5 and 8 says, stay alert, don't go to sleep. They, they want you to be asleep. Watch out for the great enemy, your devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. devour. I told you about the lion sitting back in the cut. Listen, this next scripture, I want you to listen to how much God loves us. All right. He really loves us. Romans 8, 31 through 39 says, what shall we say about such wonderful things as these? If God is for us, who can be against us? Yeah. Since he had, did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, won't he also give us everything else? Yes. We don't need the world's mess. God's gonna give us everything. Who dares accuse us whom God has chosen 
for his own. No one, for God himself has given us right standing with himself. Who then will condemn us? No one, for Christ Jesus died for us and was raised to life for us. And he is sitting in the place of honor of God's right hand pleading for us. Thank you, God, for making an intercession for us, saying, come on, you can do it. I did it. I came to show you that it can be done. Hallelujah. Can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or persecution or hunger or destitute or danger or threatened with death? As the scriptures say, for your sake, we are killed every day. We are being slaughtered like sheep. No, despite all of these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ Jesus who loves us. separate us from the love of God. Neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears today nor our worries for tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation can ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. But we can choose to separate ourselves from him. We can choose not to love him back. We can choose to practice a lifestyle of sin. You see, decisions can take you out of the will of God, but it will never take you out of his reach because he has that love for you. He's standing there just like this. Come, come. How is your relationship with the Savior? As you heard in these verses, he really, really, really loves us and he wants a relationship with us. What are you planting in your garden today? What little foxes are you allowing to eat at the base of your vine or your relationship with the Lord today? What is your state of being? Do you have an existing connection or relationship with him today? He wants you to be in an exclusive relationship with him. No one and no anything else should come between you and him. Don't be deceived by what this world tells you. If you want relationships with people, then you have to have the most important relationship and that is with him. And that is the one that matters. When you're laying on that dying bed, your friends ain't going to be able to help you. It's going to be Jesus. Lord, Father, God, Receive me, Lord, receive me. He is the only bridge that's going to take you over the troubled water here and that world to come that he will save you from the wrath of God that is coming on the children of disobedience and it's going to come. And I tell you, Bible study, y'all need to get here. We're in Revelations and it has changed my thinking. Hallelujah. It has changed my thinking to get serious about our walk. I, you know, this, this world, when you say church, people think of a mockery, what people are doing nowadays. We need to stand up and do what the Lord told us to do. Romans, I know y'all tired of my scriptures, but I'm almost done because it is needed for me and for you. Romans 13, 11, 14 says, this is all the more urgent for you to know how late it is, time is running out. For our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. You know, we all hyped up when we first get believed. We run around telling everybody, and then we get kind of lazy. You know, I, I'm saying it'll be all right. No, it won't. He wants to take you to higher heights, higher heights. Hallelujah. So wake up for our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is almost gone. The day of salvation will soon be here. So remove your dark deeds like old dirty clothes and put on the shining armor of right living. Right living. 
because we belong to the day. We are not children of the night. We must live decent lives for all to see. You know that we are an epistle to be read by men. We're an open book. They're looking at, if you got a little piece of lint right there, they're looking at that. They're examining you. You say you love God, they're examining your every move, your every word that drops out of your mouth, what you wear, what you eat. They're looking at you, what you drink. They're looking at you. 13 says, because we belong to the day, we must live decent lives for all to see. Don't participate in the darkness of wild parties and drunkenness and sexual promiscuity and immoral living or in quarreling and jealousy. All mad at somebody in the church. Pastor told you last week about that offense. You, you, how you think the Lord gonna forgive you and you won't forgive somebody else? Instead, clothe yourself with the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ and don't let yourself think about the ways to indulge in evil desires. And if you don't have a relationship with him or your relationship is rocky with him, today is the day to get it right. Tomorrow definitely is not promised to us. We all, all me included, we need God to check us Correct us, direct us, refresh us on a daily basis. It, I, I told you before, it ain't I repent done in one. No, no, no. It's a, a walk, a daily walk. It's a lifestyle. Hebrews 3, 15 is my last scripture. NLT says, remember what it says. Today, when you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts like the children of Israel did in the day of provocation. You hear him speaking to you today. He's talking. I know he is because he talked to me before I got here to get this to you. He talked to me. So I know he's talking. His spirit is moving and talking. Don't think about what anybody else is doing. Don't think about how they're going to think about you. They ain't gonna be thinking about you in hell. Jesus. Yeah, regardless of that, all those jokes they got about hell, you ain't gonna be talking to nobody. Ain't gonna be no party down there. Ask, ask the rich man. He looked over, saw Abraham and the, and the poor man, Lazarus, and he was still arrogant in hell talking about him. Send him over here to dip his finger in some cool water. How arrogant are you already in hell? He said, there's a gulf between me and you. I can't come over there. You can't come over here. No exits in hell. Final destination. And yes, if, if it's scaring you, good. If it's going to change your life, I want you to be scared if it's going to change your life. People don't want to talk about hell. I love you with a genuine love, just like God. He loves you with an everlasting love. He continues to wait on you. He's not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but listen, it, all of this time is being given to us. That's why he hasn't came yet. He loves you so well. He's trying to gather everybody in. But you have to make the choice. You're not a robot. And again, I wouldn't want somebody I had to make love me either. I'm going to pay you to love me. I'm going I'm to force you to come and love me. No, God wants you to love him for who he is. Amen. And listen, I, I would like everybody to come to this altar today, me included. I'm going to get right here on my knees. I think I better get a rubber thing. I'm old. But we're going to pray and ask God to search us, search our hearts. Those little foxes that we try to ignore or the world has desensitized us to sin till we think it's okay. It's all right. You know, there ain't nothing wrong with that. Yes, there is. Be mindful of God in everything that you do, everything that you say, everywhere that you go having to search your heart. That's one of my personal prayers every day, God. 
please, Lord, search my heart. Because a lot of times I don't see things in there. I need you to pull them out. I, I don't want to go to hell. That place ha, where the word never dies. I don't want to go there. I don't want you to go there. I wouldn't worse, but wish that on my worst enemy. I don't want anyone to go there. So I'm going to start to stand up even more. You're not going to be liked anyway. People don't like you no way. So love them enough to tell them the truth. I didn't tell my friend the truth. I was a young Christian, and then there's been people after that that I didn't tell the truth. Tell them the truth, because it's real. God is real, hell is real. So I will ask the altar worker to come, and ask you guys to please come to the altar. And we're going to pray today. Father God, just thank you, God, for your love toward us. Hey, this is Pastor Stephen Worley. Thank you for watching this video. Please like, comment, and subscribe. If you'd like to donate to this ministry, go to ShilohHub.com. Remember to hit the bell for notifications, and we'll see you next time.